But well, trust that. Uh, but can we hear me? Is everybody hearing? Okay, praise God. All right, let's just uh, welcome one another. Just greet each other. Just welcome somebody close to you. Just tell them shalom. Thank God for bringing to another day in service again. I will greet you one another. I will welcome each other to church. Praise God. I welcome each and every one of us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, today, let's just stand up and take a text so that we'll just set the background for our class immediately. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, text that we have been taking. First Corinthians chapter First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 26. Of course, we know the context of this um, text already, so we just hit the high point. Are we all there? May we rise up, please? I read. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. We therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight we, not as one that beateth the air. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word in Jesus' name. We may be seated. Praise God. So by the grace of God, we want to just continue in the series we have been looking at. Those for the rapture. And like you said, reference really to the living saints. And um, yesterday we were looking at the, 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 the end point of Christianity. We are looking at Christianity. Why? Why was Christianity put in place? We're looking at that to understand the image, the end product that Christ wants to rapture. Because that what Christianity was put in place to produce, that is what God is going to come and rapture today. And we're saying that it is the likeness of God in a man. That is what Christianity, that's why Christianity was given. It was given to bring man to the estate where man can think and reason and act and behave like God. And we are seeing that yesterday that this likeness being born in a man is the prerequisite for the rapture. It's, 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 the, it's the minimum expectation. You know when they say the cut-off mark. So the cut-off mark for the rapture is the likeness of God. So we must we must be like God to be a part of the rapture. And what that implies to us, when we look at that and we understand that, we now understand why the Buddhists will not be in the rapture. Why the Hare Krishna man will not be in the rapture. It, the monks, all those people that have dedicated their lives to goodness and, and all these things, we now understand why they will not be in the rapture. It's not that they are stealing or they are lying or they are committing fornication and doing one of all these things. A lot of them even live as hermits. So it's not because they are committing one sin, if I will use that word in quote, now they are, they are doing one thing. That's why they will not be in the rapture. The reason why they will not be in the rapture is because that they will not be like God. 
That's the same reason why the denominationals will not be in the rapture. So when we say the denominationals will not be in the rapture, it's not because they were lying or stealing or cheating or playing while you or things like that. It's because that they don't have the likeness of God. They are not like God. That is why uh, they will not be in the rapture. And so we are seeing that it also drives down back to us also, even we that have received the message. If we do not come up in this likeness of God, we will also not be in the rapture. And it's our prayer that as we have come to seek his face for his spirit to give us the grace to begin to run along that pathway, we will hit that destination in Jesus Christ's name. But I just wanted to start my class this morning by highlighting something, which is the separation. Because that when we look at this thing, sometimes it begins to look as if God is not just. But God is a God of justice. But what is the separation now? The separation is always the word. The Buddhist man and the, and the Hare Krishna and all of all those people, it's not as though God sidelined them. They heard about Christ. But they downplayed it. To them, what they have is sufficient enough. They did not give diligence to go and find out more about this man, Jesus. They will tell you that, yes, Jesus was a good man. There were other good men too. Buddha was also a good man. The Krishna man was also a good man. Muhammad was a good man. Um, you know, all these people, they were good men. So, Jesus was only one of the good men. They did not take time to go and find out what was peculiar about Christ to them because that to them what they had was enough. That is the separation. They downplayed and turned the world down. And that is the same problem that the denomination has have. They have accepted Jesus. But we are talking about that Jesus has certain things he has put in place. Jesus has certain things that he has said that we must obey. But what happened? They downplayed it. To them, what they have is sufficient. What they have is enough. They have their miracles. They have their large congregations. They have their large crowds. Many people are giving their lives to Christ when they preach. Many healings and things are taking place. God is blessing their ministries financially and abundantly. And they are opening new, new churches every year, every year. So to them, it's sufficient. When you are not beginning to talk about, look at what the Bible says. Look at what the Bible says. Look at what the Bible says. Here. They downplay it. To them, it's not necessary. That becomes a separation. And us too, unfortunately, even those that are in the message, it is also the separation to us. Because the Lord is also letting us to see what his standard is. But unfortunately, the same problem we still find itself replaying. No matter how much we stress the importance of the word, we still find that some we still downplay it. Some we still take it for granted. Why? Because that to them, what they think that what they have is sufficient. They think that what they have is enough. That is always a separation. So God is a God of justice. When God will take the ones that he will take, it will not be unfair, it will not be partiality. It is that everybody had an equal chance. They just downplayed what the standard was to be. But may that not be our portion in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today we are going to be looking at the fourth class in this, um, in this series, Those of the Rapture. I want to look at the rapturable faith. We have talked about it a lot, the rapturable faith. So I want to, want to look at it. The rapturable faith. The, the faith that those people that are being in the rapture need to have to be in the rapture. That's the rapturable faith. So I want to look at it. And to, to give a background... I want to start from a little discussion. Let's just gist some more. It's been long we gisted. And you know me, I really like gist. I'm, I'm an apropos preacher. So let's gist some more. How many of us used to watch movies? We used to watch film. Okay. All right. Some of us don't, maybe we don't watch anymore again, no time. But how many of us used to watch film before? At least we have, there was a time when we used to watch film. Before, we used to watch film a lot. Okay. Now, um, 
Let, let two people just tell me their best film, their best movies. Okay, Bra Sunday. Let us tell me your best movie. Okay, then Sister Favor. Uh, my, my best movie that I ever watched it was a funny, a comic uh, movie, Tom and Jerry. Oh, Tom and Jerry. Yes. <laughs> Those two cats are rats. You go laugh, Taya. Okay, Shalom, Sister, your best movie. Zina. Sorry? Zina, the warrior princess. <laughs> Zina, the warrior princess. Okay, sir, your best movie. How <laughs> I many of us are watching around the warrior princess? Yes, One woman will just beat everybody for the world. Nobody they beat her more. <laughs> well, amongst many, I choose uh, Titanic because it was a classic for me. Titanic? Yes. Oh, <laughs> that film where they were, your love was just they were killing people. People were dying inside water up and down. Okay, Shalom, sir. Your best movie. My best movie was Hercules. Sorry? Hercules. Okay, Hercules. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Okay, praise God. Now, um, the, how many of us has not watched Zina? Okay, I've not watched Zina. Um, how many of us have not watched Titanic? How many of us have not watched Titanic? Oh, sorry, I've not watched Titanic. Ah, okay, yeah. Uh, which film have you watched? <laughs> Ultimate power. How many of you watch Ultimate Power? Ultimate Power. Uh -huh. Good. Okay, how many of you have not watched Ultimate Power? Oh, you have not watched it? Hey, whoa. Oh, ah, yeah. As I wish, uh, which, uh, uh, many people have not watched that one. Uh. Have you watched any? Gods are dead. Okay, one series like that. Yes, I think I. Uh, Gods are dead. Have you watched that one? Anybody have not watched Gods are dead? Okay, I'm not going to see it. Okay, let me use Titanic. I think Titanic is very popular. Did you enjoy the film? Very, very well. Okay. So let me ask a question. Women, now this one will really catch you now. Wait, wait. How many of us have watched a film and to the point where we cried? <laughs> see, watch the film. Before we noticed the apple, we'll attack them off our eye. <laughs> Hour of grace. Well, I watched it, eh? Okay. All right. I know say men sometimes they had us to cry. But how many of us has watched a film until we vex? Or can they, maybe we can't the vex or the actor. Idiot! <laughs> well, that thing has happened to us, eh? Okay. Now. In movie, in the movie industry, there's something that they call suspension of belief. Sir? In the movie industry, eh? Okay, good, sir. So there's something that they call suspension of belief. I was going to ask about it, but let me just define it, then I'll now bring it into our experience as we are watching movies. Now, suspension of belief says that for you to enjoy a movie, you have to Pause your senses. You have to pause your thinking. That intelligence that you have, you will carry them, put them for pocket, so that you feel enjoy this film. So, let me illustrate it. Now, let me bring it out to the movie. Um, this thing. Now. Should be for Titanic, for example, now so uh, Jack now finally died because he was, um, you know, he was doing on top of that water something, something. He was for me hero, you know, doing on top of that water thing like that. Then I ah, know I want you to as the woman to be there to be saved while he was now on the this thing. Okay, how I many of us I watched criticism of that place that that thing that the girl was on it was more than enough to contain two of them. She will know. But you know, say, if you use that mind, stay watch the film, that part not will switch you. Because for your mind, you'll say, what is this or there they do? My friend climb on top of the team, they call carry on, I come on here. But for you to enjoy it, you need to 
carry that sense, says, and put it in your pocket, and assume that you don't know that that thing will contain two of them. Then, all those times when Jack was now, Cole was catching Jack inside the water, you will not be like, ah, see love. Abby? Um, Zena the warrior princess, uh, or Nikita, that was another one that's like Zena the warrior princess. You know, that woman, she just they beat everybody. Bah, bah, just anything, as she catch you like that, it could just beat you. Me and you know, say, you know, get one woman, want to chop rich, but you can't shack and be, just beat all the men when you just catch all the world. We know, say, not go happen, she be. But if we carry that mind and watch the film, we will not enjoy it. So we have to carry that sense, put it in your pocket, so that you can sit down and enjoy the movie. Abi? Sometimes you are watching the both film, you will see where the actor, only in one, go use fake a knife, take climb mountain. Then as he reach there, he will not stand like actor, he will not say, yes, he made it. Abi? But if we don't suspend belief, if we use our sense to watch that thing, we go to see which kind of wish we down. Ah, you want to use fake a knife, take climb mountain. We will not enjoy the movie. Right? You know, anything, any film, Nigerian film, like Caleb said, that one, I don't know how the, our sisters say they watch them, but if, as a man, if they watch them, you reverse anyhow. They were just the waka they come. The answer, they the corner there, a person will look like this, you go just do it, not see. No, sorry, Nigerian film is even good. Lamuje, Lamuje, what is their uh, Indian film and their Z world? Oh, God. They will not come. Oh, nay, nay. They... <laughs> <laughs> you know, say we brothers will not if you watch all those things because that that will not feel that kind of level of suspense. <laughs> right? Okay. Now that concept or that thing is called suspension of belief. But now, let me ask you something. We want to watch this movie. Or if we sit down now and put a film to watch, do we deliberately tell ourselves that, Daniel, right now you are about to watch a film, so that your sense carry it and put it in your pocket before you watch this film? Do we deliberately tell ourselves that? So when we suspend belief, it's subconscious. We just subconsciously do it. And sometimes, when somebody is even trying to fall some of these things, we turn and tell them. You don't know say that film. I better forget this thing when you they do. You now sit down and concentrate on the movie, right? So that means that suspension of belief when we are watching movies and all of all these things, it's not conscious. It's actually subconscious, right? But now, the fact that we have subconsciously suspended belief, the effect. They are very real. Because when they watch that film, so sometimes when we know the apple water don't come off our eye. There was one film my wife was watching one time. Cell 67, I'll be 60 now, be one thing. Sorry? Uh -huh, miracle in cell, uh -huh, something like that. Should be you cry when you watch the film. <laughs> anybody must, eh? Anybody who watch that film must cry. Somebody died inside the film, should be. And it's the person's death that pain the person that will pain you to cry. Okay. Now, in real life, did that person die? So in real life, the person will not die. But as you they watch the film, so you they cry. So that means that whereas we have subconsciously suspended belief, but the effects are very real. It affects us in a very real manner. How together? So I want to pick this now, this concept as we look at this subject, this subject of suspension of belief. So what will suspension of belief now be? Suspension of belief is choosing de to, dis to disregard a truth temporarily for the purpose of enjoying some temporary benefit or pleasure. Right? Suspension of belief is choosing deliberately or choosing to ignore a truth so that you can enjoy 
a particular benefit or pleasure or something, sometimes temporarily too, and things like that. So, for example, how many of us have maybe heard if we have not seen or had a friend, a lady? I guess that is in the catch mostly, but sometimes even guys too. How many of us have had a friend that was in a relationship with a boy? The whole world can see visibly that this boy is just using this girl's head. But no matter how you try to tell this girl rich, she will never believe. It happens, she be. Then when the boy now does certain things that that is clear for your eye. Say this is just a sign that this boy is using you, and then you're not going to tell the girl, see this thing. The girl will now, and maybe you can't even report to you. I tell you, <laughs> it happens, right? And then sometimes the girls will not even tell you that, even if leave them like that, I will change him. We have heard things like that, Shabi. Okay. So, suspension of belief. Choosing to disregard a truth temporarily for the purpose of enjoying some temporary benefit or pleasure. And now, whereas remember, we said that you choose to ignore or disregard a truth. But whereas you have disregarded or ignored a truth, the effects are still very real. So, for example, I know full well that this actor in this film has not died. I know full well. But yet, I will still cry. Ah, uh, why are you crying? Say, uh, if you see the way this man died, it's such a very painful death. Right? Okay. And sometimes, really, this thing is so strong that how many of us know Patience Uzoku, Nigerian film? Mama G. Uh -huh. Have we ever heard things like, ah, the first time I met Mama G, I was so surprised. She's such a nice woman. Right? Now, why was that person surprised? Because all her film, she said that wicked mother in law, or witches and wizard, or one thing or the other, or wicked neighbor. Right? Then now, when you now when that person now when we now, when you now meet Patient Zoku and she's now so calm and kind and everything, you now begin to like ah, Patient Zoku. She in real life she's a very kind woman. Who will be surprised, right? Now let me ask something. This person that is surprised now, so is it that he does not know that all those things he have been watching since a film? They know, ba. Is it that they don't know that all those things that they have been watching inside scenes now acting? They know. But the effect of this suspension of belief is so strong that it carries over into real life that they begin to unconsciously apply that thing to the same person. Right? I don't know where I'm getting it. I want to drive somewhere now, so... So, suspension of belief and its effect. So, against this background, I want to ask us a question. I want us to gist a little bit. And please, the subject I want to bring up now is a very, it's a very uncomfortable subject for discussion. But, you know, like I used to say, I like using extremes. Because sometimes extremes make us to see certain things clearly. How many of us has had... Maybe a loved one, a friend, a neighbor, a colleague, especially somebody that was very young that died. I know of us have experienced something like that. Maybe a colleague, a neighbor, somebody you know, especially somebody that was young. You may not know the person personally, but you just know the person in your area. They not tell you that ah, that person don't die. You. How many of us have experienced things like that? Now, when something like that happens, be a statement like, ah. That person don't die. Ah, ah, how come? Do we hear things like that? Do we hear things like, when I heard that that person was dead, I was shocked. I don't understand. What happened? 
Do we hear things like that? Now, sometimes, even not necessarily even young, even elderly ones. When you hear that maybe some elderly person or somebody that is advanced or something has died, they are not like, ah, are you serious? No, 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 come, that's not what I tell the joke. Oh. They will not be like, yes, so well, it's really true. Somebody that I saw yesterday, he said, yes. See, come, 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 come. No, no, don't uh, joke expensive play. I'm not joking, I'm serious. Ha, ha, he died. What happened? Have we experienced things like that or heard or seen? Okay, so now I want to ask us a question. When that kind of thing happens, why are we surprised? Anybody? When that kind of thing happens, why are we surprised? Let me ask what I'm asking. Do young people die? We all know that young people die. We all know that people die suddenly. We know. Right? On the news every day, we hear things like accident happened, 20 people died. We hear things like gunshot, somebody just died. Abby? Bandits happened, somebody just died. Right? So, we know, everybody that is sitting down here knows that young people can die. Right? So, upon that basis, I'm asking a question. Why are we now surprised when we now hear that a young person that we know died? I will, okay. Okay, sir. Praise God. Amen. There is like um, a prior mindset or ideology a belief that people have towards circumstances that people are meant to die. Probably, the belief that is people should die when they get old or when they are sick and it becomes obvious that this person is sick unto death, then that person dies, everybody is oppressed that, that yes, this one I knew that he was going to die. So, it's like people already have in their mind, at the back of their mind, how they think that people should die. So that's my question also. So why? Because that these people that are having this thing at the back of their mind, if you ask them, is it possible for a young person to suddenly die? What will be the answer? So then when it happens, why are they surprised? <laughs> Pastor, say maybe because it don't happen. <laughs> okay. Now, does Pastor Tokbe eat? Pastor Tokbe eats. Right? So if you come somewhere and see Pastor Tokbe eating, will you be surprised? Why will you not be surprised? <laughs> because we know that he eats. So even if I've never seen him eating before, if I come now and I see him eating, I will not be shocked. Eh? I will see that he eats. Right? So... <laughs> <laughs> so, when we see Pastor Tokpe eating, we are not going to be shocked because that we know that Pastor Tokpe eats. So, now my question, we know that young people die. So, when a young person dies, why are we shocked? <laughs> now, okay, let me ask. The stories of young people dying, you know, um, if you are watching news and you hear that um, maybe a bus was taking students to school and then um, the bus had an accident, all the students died, will you be shocked? It's normal now, it's on the news, we hear it every day. When we hear it, we don't be like, ah! How come boss just had accident? We don't. We just like, ah, this world self, eh? Shall we? But then, maybe there's one of your neighbor that you have not been seeing since. Ah, where is this, um, 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 uh, where is, uh, Joan? I never see Joan since. Then you now hear that, ah, uh, ah, uh, you know, you say Joan don't die. You don't be sure. Ah, uh, uh, 
What happened? That boss now went died. Ha ha! Kai, no, this person is not supposed to die. Should we hear things like that? So now my question is, why are we now shocked? The answer to that is suspension of belief. What happens really is that somehow people suspend belief when it comes to death. That whereas we know that a young person can die, but we suspend that belief when it comes to our young ones, to people that we know. So then when it happens to them, we are shocked because that whereas it is a truth that young people can die, but when we relate about our people that we know and things like that, that truth, we carry it and put it in our pocket. That thing, it was not conscious. It was subconscious. But we see how real the effects are. Out together. Because that if belief was not suspended, the natural response to things like that is, ah, ah that's why this world, then we need to, we need to, God needs to come quick home. I know they're understanding. Not surprised that ah, this kind of thing can happen. Because that we already know. If somebody now asks you that, ah, uh-uh, you be the pray may die before. Your response to the person will be like, person when young, not they die. Why are you be surprised? And the first time when they hear say person when young die, you will not be even questioning the person. And actually, that's what happened. Um, there's a very a family friend that the little daughter died. And then I when I traveled last time i met with one of our family friends as we were just talking and then he brought her and he was shocked and i was surprised at the shock and i was like i don't understand is there anywhere they wrote it that this person is above dying he said no i said then why are you why are you surprised at that she said i said ah, no that kind of person she's not supposed to die i said i don't understand is there did they enroll is there a roll call is there is there a where you go and enroll so that you can die and the person was surprised at my not being surprised and things like that and that's actually what has happened suspension of belief <laughs> yes yeah, so the people talk like that to say now make it the person but now why am i bringing this up to show us that this concept of suspension of belief is so strong that whereas it is subconscious, it affects our daily lives. And that is the reason why we see today young people, especially even adults, come and worship God. Everybody, at least in this part of the world, most people agree that when a man dies, he's going to face God. Most people agree. But this same person that will tell you that and most people agree that the things they are doing, if they die in that state, they are going to hellfire. And they will tell you that, ah, no, I don't want to go hellfire. But those things, do they change it? Why? Suspension of belief. Somehow, whereas they know that as I'm going out now, so it is possible that I will not come back. Whereas they know, if you ask them, is it possible that as you are going to go and buy egg just in your streets now, so motor can just jam you and you just die, they will tell you yes. They know. It is a truth that they know. But when they are going, getting up to go and buy that egg, they don't put their affairs in order. Why? They suspend belief. Somehow, that truth that they know that it can happen, they carry it and put it in their pocket and believe that it will not happen. And then when you're not even telling you, say, oh, no, it's not my portion, oh, God forbid. But if you ask them, can it happen? They will tell you yes. So upon what strength are you saying it's not your portion? Suspension of belief. Altogether. Are we there? So now, we see that 
this concept affects people in their daily activities, in all the things that they do. Maybe from today, take time to be observing people in their actions and in the things that they do. Then interact with them. You observe this thing very, very well. This concept of suspension of belief. You observe it a lot. Now let's go to our subject this morning. We are talking about those of the rapture, the rapturing faith. And okay, before I go on, let me just establish. So basically, this suspension of belief causes men to do two things. To procrastinate life-changing decisions or to misplace priorities. So because they suspend belief, decisions they are supposed to take, they put it up to later. So for example, come and worship God, they say later. Or they misplace priorities. Things that are more important, they put it secondary. Things that are frivolous, they put it first. And remember, I will say that why do people suspend belief? It is all in a bid to enjoy some temporary benefits. All together. Amen. Okay. So now let's have this as our background to look at this subject of the rapturing faith. And to drive this subject, I want to read 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16. Sorry, 1 Thessalonians 5. First Thessalonians 5. I'll start from verse 1. The Bible said, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So let's look at that. Why would the day of the Lord come as a thief in the night? First of all, what does it mean? It means it to be unexpected. When a thief is coming in the night, does not announce it. It just comes suddenly. Right? So, Paul is saying here that the coming of the Lord will be as a thief in the night. And of course, I hope we know that this refers to the rapture. Because at the second coming of the Lord, not in the rapture now, when he comes back, it's not going to be as a thief in the night. Everybody go see him. Revelation chapter 1, verse 11 or so. Say, every eye shall see him, and they that pierce him shall will because of him. So, not that one now it is the rapture that is as a thief in the night now why is he going to be as a thief in the night is it that he did not tell people that he will come are they, of course well, when we're talking about the rapture now the reference really is to the church the world is not expecting any rapture so that one is just up down is down their own the church but to the church is going to come as a thief in the night now, why is he coming as a thief in the night? Is it that they were not aware? Now, a thief in the night, they are not aware that he's coming. And so they are surprised when he comes. Because that the thief did not tell them. But now look at our Lord's coming. Is it really as a thief in the night? Did he not tell the people that he's coming? Is there anybody in church today that does not know that Christ is coming? In fact, he, Pastor Tokba was even telling us yesterday that even Muslims are saying that he's coming. So everybody knows that he's coming. So the question now is this. Why is his coming now going to be as a thief in the night? Thank you, sir. Because that the church suspended belief. Suspension of belief. All right. So now about verse 3. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Now is this scripture not here? It is in the Bible. Right? Is this a hidden book? Everybody has this Bible. But will this thing happen? So whereas it's in the Bible, they are still going to rise up and say peace and safety. And then sudden destruction will come upon them. How come? I think it's evil people that have that parable. That stone when I see, not the blind them. I mean, see there are those that have that parable. They say stone when I see, not the blind them. So, but how come this stone when I see, the blind these people? Suspension of belief. Now, 
For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travel upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now, verse 4. We are looking at, remember, we are not looking at the world. We are looking at those for the rapture. Verse 4 now begins to speak to of those for the rapture. He said, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. So that means that those for the rapture, to them, the Lord's coming will not be as a thief in the night. So that means that whereas the Lord's coming will overtake, we take the world as on our ways. Those for the rapture, the coming of the Lord, the rapture will not take them on our ways. So the question, why will the rapture not take those for the raptures on our ways? The answer is that there will be no suspension of belief. The effects of the suspension of belief would have been rolled away from their lives. Are we together? Now, let's look at this now and compare it with what we have today. Touching the coming of the Lord, we have two groups of people. We have those that don't even want, once you tell them, say, ah, the Lord will come soon. They don't even want him to come. They will tell you that, no, I beg, I beg, may the Lord not come, and all may come. Uh, some, I've even heard, I don't know why people still say it now, but in those days, at least when I used to interact a lot with a lot of people in school, when you mention it, it's that I say, ah, it not come before they bomb me. When, now when I never marry, I never enjoy, I never do this one. Now it won't come. I be made a way to my affair marry first. My enjoy my hammer first. So, first group of people, they don't even want him to come. To them, they have something more important that they want to do first before he can come. Then, there is the second group, which are those that want him to come. But they don't believe that it can happen in the next five minutes. Ah, I pray that the Lord will come. Home. But you tell them that, ah, can the Lord come this night? No, I beg. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Please remember, when we're talking of subconscious, that's why I, I, I try to drive this subject of suspicion of belief. It's not conscious. They don't consciously say it that i don't think the lord can come this night or i don't think the lord can come in the next five minutes in their conscious in their consciousness yes the lord can come in the next five minutes but now look at this person that is saying that I just told you now that the lord can come in the next five minutes so ask this person now so what are your life goals you say ah um, I intend to, when I finish school, I'm going to go to a social place to borrow money, then I'm not going to marry, then I'll now, at least by God's grace, if I can have like 15 million, I should be able to do my marriage, then maybe I'll now go to Canada, then at least I'll now open this business, then I'm looking at like three or, or more children, and that's actually why I'm going to study the course I'm studying, because that in the next 30 years, this course will be the... Now, he just told you now that he believes that the Lord can come in the next five minutes. But look at this person, so. So what is it? Suspension of belief. Whereas he has consciously told you, subconsciously, he does not really believe that in the next five minutes the Lord can come. And Abraham brother Caleb has told us that sometimes when he's talking to people, and he will not tell you that, and when I tell you, say Jesus will soon come, you'll be like, say, you say, I know me now. They will be surprised. I don't know understanding. Now look at this same person that told you that, ah, it's very possible that before the service ends, God will come. As he's sitting in this service, he's thinking of the profit he wants to make now, so and how he, and the investment he wants to do, and how that investment at least I will just put this money in fixed savings. Then in the next ten years, by the time you think we now mature, I cannot collect it and now use it to. Oh, okay, no, I think I need to go and buy this land and keep it so that I, I need to save money now to buy this land. Ah, why are you struggling to buy that land so that I need to build a house because by the time by the time I get old, so I need a place of my own where I will be able to stay so that I'll be and. and Ah, but this person I just told you that in the next five minutes Christ can come. I don't know what I'm understanding. So those are the two groups of people now that we have in the church with respect to the coming of the Lord. Both of them, suspension of belief is affecting them but in two different ways. Now, first and foremost, the first group, 
those that don't want him to come, first and foremost, they can never be in the rapture. Because as the scripture said, that the rapture is for those that love his appearing. So those that don't love his appearing, first and foremost, you can never be there. So if peradventure there is that leaning on the inside of us, it means that there is something wrong. We need to correct it. We need to ask the Lord to give us the grace to love his appearing. If this world and the glories and the pleasures of this world, like our pastor has been teaching us in, that, in this series that we'll be looking at, um, um, Strangers are Pilgrim. If this world is so interesting and sweet to you, that if they say, let's go tomorrow, you are unwilling to go, you cannot go. You will be here. Praise God. So, we are not even talking to those ones in these our messages. Let's keep those ones aside. Our reference and our scope are to those in the second category. Those who really want the Lord to come. But suspension of belief has been, is affecting them. That's who this um, teaching is addressing. Now, for this group of people to be in the rapture, first and foremost, that suspension of belief has to be removed from them. Otherwise, they will not be in the rapture. Why do I say so? Because that if the rapture were to come now, they will be caught on our ways. But those that are in the rapture, that are to be in the rapture, they will never be caught on our ways. And why would they be caught on our ways? It's because that whereas they are saying with their mouth that he can come, they are not really expecting him. We are not really, as we said here, we are not really expecting that before this service ends, he will come. If really he comes, that is, maybe as we are just talking now, so, then some people just miss in our midst. The rest that are remaining will be shocked. Why? Because whereas we know that he can come, na 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 na. We are not expecting to come now, 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 now. Are we together? As we are sitting here now, if, for example, something happens, and then, of course, when the Lord comes, he will not be dealing with the Gentiles again, like Pastor Tokwa used to always tell us. So, but let's just assume. A prophecy now, or somehow, somehow God now communicates to us that, ah, rapture happened this afternoon by 3 o'clock. Oh, everybody sitting down here today, now, will be shocked. Ah. Rapture, how? Why? Because of suspension of belief. All together. But now, this suspension of belief, it has to be removed from those for the rapture. And this thing, it is God that will do it. Not a man. It's God that will do it. The thing that God is going to use to do this is what is called the rapturing faith. The thing that God is going to use to cure this suspension of belief from the church is what is called the rapturing faith. So, how will God do it? Or, no, rather, when will God do it? I don't know. But I know. That before the church goes in the rapture, that thing must be done. And we are going to show from the scriptures by the grace of God. Amen. So then, how does this concern us now? What do we now do with this information? We must now begin to desire that that suspension of belief be rolled away from our lives. And God will help us in Jesus Christ's name. So now, let's look at it. So like we have said, those of the rapture, they will not be caught on our ways. They will know the, when that rapture comes. There will be no suspension of belief in their life. So but now let's look at something. This knowledge that they are going to know, is it that they are going to know that, please are you following me? Is it that they are going to know that on August 15th, by 6.55, Christ will come. Is that how they are going to know it? Or they will know that, uh, well, it's going to, the Lord is coming on June 12th, 1982, by 11 p.m. No, sir. That's not how they are going to 
that that's not how that knowledge is going to be. So how will it be? When we say that they are going to know, it is that they will not be caught on our ways because they have overcome the suspension of belief around the rapture. They will have come into an atmosphere that whenever the rapture come, it will not come as a surprise. The very core of their existence would have accepted that the rapture is an occurrence that is. They will be living in that reality. So whether they are asleep or they are awake, in fact, they will have come into an atmosphere that the more time is going, the more they are surprised. That, ah, he has not come. Because that they, they are in an atmosphere, they are in a frame where the, con the concept of the rapture is a now event for them. How together? And this will come about how we God bring do this, it is by a revelation that will be in them. And we are going to look at, examine this subject or examine this concept by looking at the three people that were raptured in the scripture, Enoch, Elijah, and Christ. And so first of all, we can see from Elijah and Elisha, we are going to go in depth into it, but I just want to make this as a point now. Elijah Elisha knew that Elijah would soon be taken. Right? But if you notice, when Elijah was taken, Elisha was surprised. And the Bible says he cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. It took him on our ways. But we did not hear anything from Elijah. There was no scream or shout or anything. Okay. We are saying how we they we they come by this expectation. It's by a revelation that will be in them. And to understand this revelation that will be in them, we for for look at these three people. Why were they? raptured. Like we were saying yesterday, Enoch was raptured in a figure. The seventh from Adam. As a figure to let the church know when to expect the rapture. All together. Enoch was raptured in a figure to let the church know when to expect the rapture. How that it will be at the hour that is the seventh from Adam. And when you look at Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Laodicean church is the seventh from the second Adam. And that's the reason why Enoch was raptured. Him being the seventh from Adam. We are going to go into it later and look at the expectation, how he came by that. Then now, Enoch's own is clear. Elijah's own has not really been clear until the Lord gave me grace to get an insight into why Elijah was raptured. Elijah was raptured to let the church know whose message we give, we bring people from mortality into immortality. And so we are going to find out that it's Elijah's message that is going to prepare the Gentile church for rapture. And it's Elijah's message that is going to prepare the Jewish house, the 144,000, to walk from mortality into immortality. Because at the 144,000, as we see in Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 12, from, yes, Revelation 12. Revelation 12 down to 14. The 144,000, they will not see death. The Bible said they will be preserved until the Lord comes and they walk into the millennium in life. And it's Elijah's message that was given to produce that thing in them. So to let the church know whose message will produce that, Elijah was raptured. And then the third person that was raptured is our Lord himself. To let us know whose image God is rapturing. All together. And okay, let me. So now let's look at these people. 
and see how it, the occurrence is around them. Of course, our Lord really needs no examination. Like we were looking yesterday, we were looking at yesterday. It is very clear and evident why our Lord is that image that God wants to rapture. It is very evident. Because that Christ was the very image of the invisible God. That very nature, that very personality. Christ could stand and speak and say, the son can do nothing in himself but what he sees the father do. Christ could stand and say, the son has committed, the father has committed all judgment to the hands of the son. Christ was a living, breathing replica of the likeness of God. Are we together? So, our Lord really needs no further examination from us. But let's really focus on Elijah and um, Enoch. I'm going to look at 2 Kings. So, you look at Elijah a little bit. Now, okay, for those of us that may not know, Elijah is actually a mysterious subject in the scripture. Elijah. It's a very mysterious figure in the scripture. If you notice in the scripture, there's nothing recorded about his birth or who his parents are or where he came from. Just like Christ was called a Nazarite, not because, or a, Naz, um, a, Nazar, um, um, a Nazarite, not because he was from Nazareth, but because he lived in that area. So Elijah, the Bible just said, Elijah, the, Elijah from the inhabitants of Gilead, Elijah the Tisbeth of the inhabitants of Gilead. You just know that that's really where he was staying, but his, his coming really was a shock to Israel. Um, but really not looking at that. We're just focusing on the aspect of this subject. Now, sir, they don't know this, um, how he came. And that's why the Jews today, they don't, they don't take Elijah for granted. And of course, like our teacher will always tell me, and when we are just in, Moses and Elijah, those are two characters that sometimes the church takes for granted. But the Bible calls them the two olives that stand in the presence of the Almighty God. And to show you how important and how relevant and how pivotal these two people are to the plans of God. Many years ago, there was something that Caleb uh, was letting our teacher and I was making us to see. When Christ entered into his glory as deity, it attracted the two olives that stand before him, Moses and Elijah. But I will see in Revelation chapter 4, when Christ sets in his glory, there are two olives that stand before him. So when he was transfigured, that, they just had to come. So those two characters. But anyway, we are looking at Elijah now as it regards the rapture itself. I want to start from verse 2. Okay, well, let me just start from verse 1. It said, and it came to pass when Second Kings chapter 2, sorry. Second Kings chapter 2. I will start from verse 1. I'm really going to verse 5 and 6, but let me just begin to give us a background. And it came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. So, first thing we see here is that Elijah knew when the Lord was going to take him. When the Lord was going to rapture him. Elijah was not, it was not a surprise, he knew. Okay? And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, as the Lord liveth and as I so liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. Please take note, verse 3. And the sons of the prophet that we had Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yeah, I know it. Hold thy peace. Now look at the word here. He said, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from thee? And he said, yeah, I know it. So the question, how did they know that today the Lord would take Elijah? And the only way they knew is because that Elijah told them. Elijah had made it known that today I'm going. How together? 
Hmm? Okay. No, not by, it was not my prophecy. He said it. So how do we know it's not my prophecy? Let me answer it now. Please take note. Today. And he said, yes, I know. So that means Elijah told them that today I'm going. All together. All right, now. Verse 4. Now, the Bible said they came from Gilgal to Bethel. So it was in Bethel that they told them that today he is going. And they said, yes, I know. Now, verse 4. And Elijah now said unto him again. Elijah, tarry here, I pray thee. For the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. Verse 5. And the sons of the prophet that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yeah, I know it. Hold your peace. Now this scripture will not really come alive to us until we understand that from Jericho, from Bethel to Jericho is four days journey. From Bethel to Jericho is four days journey. So when Elijah was in Bethel, they said today. But it did not happen that day. And then he went to Jericho. And when he got to Jericho, they said today. I'll get in the picture. All right. Then now, verse 6. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee, here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, as the, soul, as the Lord liveth, and as I so liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophet went and stood to view afar off, and they, and, they, and they too stood by Jordan. And then, of course, we know the story. Elijah part that water there. They crossed Jordan. And as they were going, they were just gisting, and it happened. Now, what do we notice here? When the hour of the rapture of Elijah had come, he came into a present reality that the rapture is happening today. So if it did not happen today, it was surprising. That is, any day Elijah is living, it is that day that is the rapture. So, when these people were telling Elijah, they were mocking him. They were, when they were telling Elisha, it was a mockery. And that's the reason why I was saying, hold your peace. Not a laugh. Because that I know this man. This thing that he told me, I believe it. So don't be mocking him. Just hold your peace. Watch, you will see how things will be now soon. And how do we know that they were mocking? Because that when Elisha came back and told them that the Lord has taken Elijah, they said, will you try? But uh, should we go? Let's go and look for him. We don't know where they don't drop him now. So he said, no need. He has gone. He said, gone where? Please, ah, I better leave that matter. We know, uh, we know, you know Elijah and I can talk some kind of times now. Mo we'll go find him. The Spirit of the Lord might have carried him now and dropped him in another place. Now hunger will kill him there. Bible said, and they pressed upon Elisha, and Elisha said, okay, I'll go. And they went and searched for him for three days. When they did not find him, they came back and said, ah, eh, we not see him. Oh. But the people were saying just now that the Lord is taking him today. So there we understand. And when they were saying that, they were mocking. So why were they mocking? We are bringing Elijah in focus. Because that Elijah had come to a point where his testimony was that if when I sleep, wake up, and I don't see him again, I they go. Then they will sleep and wake up and see him. Ah, okay, I say, you they go. And eh, not today. And eh, not today. Once when I sleep, wake up. Then they will not make, wake up and meet him again. Ah, ah see you when they talk, say you they go. He say, not today. Why? There was a faith and an understanding that he had that he knew that he was going. Not going tomorrow. The rapture had become a present reality for him. And this will be the character of those for the rapture. Praise God. So, whereas Elijah said today, then he woke up the next day and still saw himself here. He did not say, ah, you should say this thing really, not really. He said, ah, okay, and today then. 
What was that faith that kept him living from day to day in that present reality? That's what's called the rapturing faith. That when you now wake up to see yourself still on this side, ah, it never happened. Okay, well, I know they go now. That means now today it will be then. Comes a present reality. Praise God. And then when we see this, we cannot understand Enoch's testimony. And let's go to Enoch's testimony. Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. There is something that if you study Enoch, there is the most repeated phrase concerning Enoch. The most, re- uh, um, how would I put it now? So, the most common and repeated thing in the Bible about Enoch is this verse 22 and Enoch walked with God if you are going to pick up the testimony of Enoch the first thing that stands out is that Enoch walked with God to establish that for us now verse 22 I said it and Enoch walked with God after he began Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters right Now look at verse 24 again. And Enoch walked with God and he was not. But they just told us that just now. They go and look at, check out Enoch in Hebrews 11, I think verse 6. Same thing is repeated here. For Enoch walked with God. So then that means this walking with God becomes a focus. And we understand that when we look at that Hebrews chapter 11. Let's look at that Hebrews 11. There's how the scripture now recorded that work to bring it out, to show you that that work was what was important. Hebrews 11, I think, verse 5. Said, by faith... Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, we are going to come to look at that testimony in a little while. We are going to come to look at that testimony in a little while. But the first thing we notice about Enoch is that the Bible said he walked with God. He walked with God until the point that he was not for God took him. And remember, we said that Enoch was translated as a figure of when the rapture will be. Now, Enoch was also translated as a figure of the character of those that will be raptured. And that's what Hebrews 11 verse 6 began to say. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, first of all, from the scripture, is Enoch the only person that walked with God? The answer is no. For we see in Genesis chapter 9, verse 5 or so, the Bible said, Noah walked with God. So there was something about the walk that Enoch had with God. Now, we will not understand that until we look at Enoch as a figure in himself. Look at Enoch as a figure in himself. To understand Enoch, we need to go to the book of Jude to get a picture of Enoch. Because I would say that Enoch was a figure of the character of those that will be translated. Jude. Jude chapter 1. Jude has only one chapter. Verse 14. The Bible said, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of this, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all 
and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So Jude was making us to see that Enoch, standing way back at that time, he saw the coming of the Lord with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment. I'm going to drop just a little bit of tidbits here. First of all, how did Jude know what Enoch said? There's no book of Enoch. But really, in the world today, there's a book of Enoch. And if you go and read that book of Enoch, you will miss him. You go miss him. Okay? But Enoch... May the Lord help us. God has written three Bibles. Right? Okay. Um, I'm trying to get us to see the height to which Enoch had come. So that we now understand why when Jude was saying that Enoch saw prophesied concerning these people before. There is where Enoch wrote his prophecy. Okay. God has written three Bibles. Psalm 19, the Bible in the sky. Zechariah, the Bible in the pyramid. And then the Bible that we have today on papyrus, the Bible in paper. Now the second Bible, which is the Bible in the pyramid, was written by Enoch. It's not, a, it's not really something that is to be taught. It's just an information. I want to bring something out from it. Now, when you look at the things that Enoch wrote, Enoch captured the whole of the salvation plan from the beginning to the end. Enoch captured the pyramidal city. Enoch captured the perfection of the saints. When Enoch was saying that God will come with thousands of the saints to judge, there has been no prior anything written about a judgment. But Enoch had seen from the beginning of time to the end of times. Enoch had come into the perfect understanding of the knowledge and work of God that he was doing. And Enoch began to write that there will come a time when people will rise up in the face of the knowledge of God. And remember, this was the period when the knowledge of God was scarce in the earth. Men have not really begun to know God and block. Those that knew God were from the household of them Enoch, of them Adam. For the Bible said in Genesis chapter 4 verse 16, in the days of Enos, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. But this people that were calling upon the name of the Lord, it was not the, it was not the genealogy of Cain. Because the genealogy of Cain, as we saw in Genesis 4, they rejected God completely. They were cut out of the covenant. The Bible said Cain went away from the presence of the Lord. So when God is seen, Cain is not in the, Cain is not in the program. Cain is not anywhere. He was outside the presence of God. But now there were those that were set in the tables of covenants. That was Adam and his genealogy, as we are seeing in Genesis chapter 5. Now, these people, to the best of their ability, they were living as, as best as they understood from what their father Adam had taught them. But under this dispensation, Enoch had already seen a group of people arise from those that know God and then begin to speak hard things against God. Begin to make hard speeches against God. Begin to rebel the knowledge of God. 
And Enoch saw. Let's go back to that Jude. Let's see the people that Enoch was talking about. From verse 10. Actually, from, from verse 1. Because that Jude really had one drive, which was the falling away. Jude was really talking to the church and telling the church that, look, whereas the faith has been established, there are going to come some that will rise up from the midst of thee and turn away. Don't be surprised, but defend what we have given you. That's really in uh, Jude's message. So he began to establish it from the scriptures. So um, he spoke about verse 6, how that it's not a new thing. The angels that left their, that kept not their first estate. So God had given them the word. They did not stay there. They went to another thing. He said they are reserved in, for condemnation. Then Sodom and Gomorrah, whereas God had made them to see what they should, they turned against it. He said that God overthrew them. And then he began to speak. Now, verse um, 10. He began to say, um, okay, let's start from verse 8. He said, likewise also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Now, these dignities that he's talking about here, he's not talking of government, too. He's talking of the dignities of the faith. So, when you hear somebody stand up and speak evil about Jonah, he's speaking evil of dignities. Now, but he began to speak, say, yet, Michael the archangel, when contending with the body of, with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. But these ones speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beast, in those things they corrupt themselves. So he was talking of people who will now begin to use their mind to try to understand what God has said. And being that brute beast, they will begin to corrupt the testimony of God. So somebody stands today when the Bible has said a woman should not be a pastor. Somebody now stands and says, is it that a woman cannot preach? Look at this woman, is preaching very well. Look at this, look at this. What is it? He said... But what they know naturally, what they know naturally, are women can be president. The, I think, I don't know whether she's still president now. But the Philippines, at one point, oh, their president was a woman. Germany, their president was a woman. So look at now, naturally, women are doing very, very well. So why would you not say that? Oh, Queen Elizabeth, is even, you understand? So what they know naturally is that women are excellent in these things. So then, but, that we, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things, they corrupt themselves. Woe to them. For they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feast of charities when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit with it, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also... So that means that all these people that we come into the faith and begin to corrupt and say these things, Enoch standing there way back saw them and began to prophesy concerning them. For he said, and Enoch also, seven from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, the Lord will come and bring judgment upon them. So Enoch came to a point where the whole purpose of God, as it was going to play forth, he saw it and understood it. Praise God. And then when you stand in this, you now understand why the Bible now said he had a testimony that he pleased God. What does that mean? Enoch had so come to know God and his ways until he had put on the likeness of God. He had put on the perceptions of God. And that's the reason why Enoch was different in the genealogy of Adam. He had so come to stand. Enoch was a preacher of immortality. Whereas the testimony that was reigning in those days is that death is the natural conclusion. Enoch did not believe in it. Because Enoch had seen the resurrection. He knew that the purpose is that God is bringing man back to this estate where man will become immortal. And so Enoch did not believe in death. And because he did not believe in death, he walked with God. Constantly. 
walking with God. And he walked with God until the point it became impossible that death should take this one. And the Bible said God took him for a testimony to those that will come up in the age to come of the character that they are to have. So when the Bible speaks of the bride as the custodians of the mystery of God, it started in Enoch. So Enoch can stand and tell you the purpose of God from creation through the redemption, through the, ju through the judgment until the final glorification of the saints. He understood the purpose and the plan of God. And whereas men were going in this other way, the Bible said he was walking with God. And I look how long he walked with God. Verse 24 of that, verse 22 of that Genesis, we want to tell us that he walked with God after he begat Lamech 300 years. Steady fellowship with God. Steady growing in the knowledge of God. Until he got to a point he was not. For God took him. So that was the difference between Enoch's work with God and Noah's work with God. Because Noah walked with God also. Faithful in his house. He saw the wickedness of the world and the Bible said it vexed him. He, he was displeased with all the things that were happening in the world. He kept his ways and all that. But this knowledge, Noah did not have it. And so, the same testimony that was said of Enoch could not be said concerning Noah. So, this understanding that he had of the coming in of the anti-faith and the corruption of death brought him to a point that he had a different disposition from the men that are in the world. And Hebrews 13 verse 8, we said that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When he had reached the point that this is what I'm looking for, God took him. And that's the same way the church will walk. The church will walk and come to a point that they will please God. That is, when God looks at them, this is man as he should be. This is the design that I had concerning man in my original conception. And that is the point where God will take the church. And so, we see that by virtue of the knowledge and the understanding that Enoch came to have, he came to a point that he became rapturable. So then, those of the rapture, how would they come to have that? By the same thing. God is going to begin to reveal his purpose to them. God is going to begin to reveal his will to them. He is going to begin to teach them his mysteries. The things that Enoch knew, God is going to begin to teach them. And in that walk, they will come to a point of understanding where that rapture becomes now. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then this causes us to go back to Revelation chapter 10 to see the opening of the seals. 
Now, the subject of the seals is one of the most misunderstood subjects in the message today. And it's one of the most downplayed subjects in the message today. And it's very sad. Because that the man that was chronicling this event, John the Beloved, like our pastor has said, he had come to a certain frame of understanding of God. His faith had combusted to a level that he boiled him in oil for 24 hours. He did not die. And that just helped to cement the belief that they had about him before. Because that our Lord said concerning John, what is it to you if I will that he tarry until I come? All the other believers, they have been captured. All the other apostles, they have been captured. And then, brutally hand malhandled by the hands of the Romans, and they died. But John, when he was captured and malhandled by the Romans, he did not die. And that just cemented that thing. Ah, it's like, oh, this man, he's going to stay until Christ comes. And all that. And we know from history that John was the only one that died of old age. And so, he had come into a certain frame of revelation and he was in Patmos. And being in Patmos, he was translated into the Lord's day. For I said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard. So, when it comes to baptism of the Holy Spirit, this man had it. When it comes to the testament, this man had it. When it comes to salvation, this man has it. This, was a, this man was a first-hand oracle. So if there's anybody that knew the redemptive work of God, this man had it. But then he came to a point that a vision played out before him. That Christ had come and had gone. The blood had been shed. He had been a recipient of this grace. But then, he now saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book. And no one was able to take the book. And the Bible said, when no man was able to take the book, this man that had all these testimonies going for him began to cry. Until he took one of his brethren to comfort him and say, weep not. For the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root and the offspring of David has prevailed to take the book. And then he looked until the lamb took the book. And the Bible said, when the lamb took the book, in heaven and on earth, they all heard me crying. What is the lamb that was slain? So, this man placed a very high premium on this book that was sealed. Until the suggestion that that book will not reach the hands of man made him to cry. But this book is the same book that message believers take for granted. And then he opened the seals. When he had opened the seals, Revelation chapter 10, he came down by himself with this book. And this book had things written inside. How together? And then he brought it down. How do we know that it had things written inside? He stood and swore. When he finished swearing, the Bible says somebody told John, go and take the book. And then John went and took the book and ate it. 
And we know what eating is. It was digesting. He took what was inside. He learnt it. He understood it. So then how do we know that it was something that he understood? Because that when he had taken it and had eaten it, the angel told him, you will prophesy again. So that means that the things that this man ate was going to come out from him. So that means that that book was a knowledge. But this knowledge that is inside these seals, the ch- well, the church doesn't even know about it. The, the bridal group, let me put it like that, let me not say the bride, those in the message downplay it and take it for granted and count it as something we knew before. Something we knew before and somebody was crying for it. And so, ate it and he said you will prophesy again. Now, this knowledge, because we have established that the church is going to come into the rapturing both faith by an understanding. This knowledge, how will it come? When will it come? I will tell you sincerely, my brethren, I don't know. But surely, by God's word, it will come. So, this rapturing faith, how is God going to build it into the believers? It is by an understanding that he will give them. By certain things that he will inform them about. Those things will produce a stature in them that they will know that they shall not see death. It will not be against sin. It will not be a wishful thinking. If somebody or something tells them that they will die, they will tell the person that it is a lie. Why? Because that today I'm going home, transforming those for the rapture. But now, like I said at the beginning of the, of this, of this, of the message, this process, it is not us that works it out. It is God himself that will work it out. And so Christ told us that it's not something you will begin to run to and fro for. Let me go here. Let me go here. Whether I say, whether I say, no. When God does it, it will be manifest. Will this be around the time of the resurrection of the saints? I don't know. But I know one thing for sure. That those for the rapture, at a point in this journey, they will come to a point where the rapture becomes a present reality for them. And what will bring them into that frame is certain things that the Lord will reveal to them. Certain things that the Lord will make them to see. Such an understanding that the Lord will, will teach them. Like he did with Enoch. Like he did with Elijah. Elijah came to a point where if they are told Elijah that he will die, he will, he will know that. Die how? It's just like after Christ had resurrected, you're not going to tell him that, do you know I will kill you? I don't understand. What are you talking about? These ones will come into that frame too. So then, for those of us that are aspiring and, and, and giving diligence to be a part of that, what should not be our frame? What should not be our own positioning? It is the same thing like the Apostle Paul told us. Give diligence to the things that have been taught to you. Lest at any point you let them slip. And that's why I started the message the way I did the separation. What will now separate those from the rapture, those that will be in the rapture, from those that will not be in the rapture? It is that no matter how we keep saying these things, they will still downplay the importance of the things that the Lord is speaking. Because that to them, they already have a calculation by the which they are going to go. So when those that we go, we go. 
the Lord will be just. Because you cannot now come to God and say, but I did not lie. I did not steal. I believed the message. I was not a fornicator. I, in short, probably I manifested gifts. I was zealous for you and all those kind of things. You cannot come to God and say that. Because the question then becomes, the things that I gave you, in any case, it will never be a question. Because by the time you even see those that went, you know that you yourself are not you and them. You are not mates. What is the dividing line? What they know. So then it becomes important to give the more earnest heed to the things that we have been told. Praise God. And that is the reason why in this our journey, the Holy Spirit becomes indispensable to us. Why? Because that when moves like this abound, certain things become the character. And that's why I want to lift up Elisha as the last exhortation of this message. The hour will come when certain people will begin to speak in a way that will cause the world to mock them. Imagine if somebody stands here now and tells you that this night rapture will happen. And then it did not happen that night. And then you now tell him that he now comes tomorrow and say, oh, okay, yes, it's, it's today, it's today, as so we are going, so it will happen. Whereas some people will begin to mock. Others will begin to ask, how do you know that it will be? And peradventure, come by that same understanding that those ones have come by. Because that revelation really doesn't come and block. It comes, everybody catches it at different times. Everybody catches it at different times. All together. And I want to believe that. No, let me leave that particular aspect. But I don't know what I will understand. So then, on this journey that we are pursuing, those of the rapture have a character. What is that? Those that will be in the rapture. What is that character? They pursue the word step by step. As Elisha was pursuing Elijah. Elijah told Elijah himself told Elisha, stay here, I'm coming. But Elisha already began to hear the way Elijah was talking. You, that kind of time, you don't that kind of person, you don't give him gap. Supposing before he goes and comes back, he has gone. No, let's be going. Anywhere you are going, I'm following you. And that's the character that we are to have with the world right now. Supposing the one that will be taught in church today is the one that we give us that rapture in faith. The United States should stay at home because I have business. Or supposing the ministration that will minister today or the songs that will minister today is what the Lord is going to use to apply this thing. The United States, I should travel. Travel where? No, let's be going. It, that's how you follow. Because at Elisha, he followed, followed, followed. And Elijah told him, well, if, you, if you can see me, go. He followed, followed, followed. Because that he was there, he received. So the bride, right now, should have a character. What is that character? Ma close marking the word. It is not now a time that we will now say, um, today is question and answers. We are looking at the things that have been taught. And we are forgotten all. Ah. Supposing that one that you have forgotten is the one that they want to quicken to give the rapturing faith. And you have forgotten it. How will they quicken it? Praise God. And Enoch walked with God. The bride must now begin to walk with God. And that's it. Because that Christ how he presents himself with us, how he steps down with us to follow us is by the word. Close marking, close marking, close marking. But now, these things, it's not going to be possible. And the reason is because, ordinarily, it's not going to be possible. And the reason is because of Matthew 24, verse 24. And the bride has downplayed that scripture for too long. But let's look at it. Matthew 24, verse 24. 
For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. We, in the message, we have played down this scripture for too much. Why? Believing in ourselves that it is impossible for us to be deceived. Why? Because that we now know that a woman should not be a pastor. We now know that baptism is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We now know that this. We now know that we now know the mission of the serpent seed. We now know this. We now know this. We now know this. But Christ himself speaking about this wave of deception began to say that if it was possible the very elect will be carried away. So then that means that this wave of deception is beyond a woman can preach. That one cannot move the bride. It cannot threaten the bride. This wave of deception is beyond um, baptism can be in the name of titles or in the name of Jesus Christ. That cannot shake the bride. The elect. The things that we, carry, that we, that we come to a point that we move the base of the very elect are the things that have to do with the mysteries that are given to the elect. So then, as we carry on, the bride is going to begin to expect from within the message waves of deception to begin to arise. Within the circumference of the faith, the very elect must be expecting this. If you are carrying yourself as if you cannot be deceived, you will be carried away. So Christ was giving this warning not to the denominationals, the very elect. Now, but why did Christ say if it was possible? The reason is because that it is impossible. But why is it impossible? It is because that the foundation of God standeth sure. The Lord knoweth those that are his. It is only going to be impossible because at the Lord we give grace to those that are his. If you think that it's going to be by your wisdom or your ability to study scriptures, there are those that know the scriptures before you that are falling from the faith, that know it more than you. We looked at the rise and fall of Lucifer the other time. There is nobody that now, there is nobody that knows God more than Lucifer, and yet Lucifer fell. See now, even in his fallen state, Lucifer knows God more than the bride right now. But yet he fell. So, the only thing that makes that, if it was possible, not possible, is that God will give grace to his own. And how does he give grace? By the Spirit. The Bible called it, said he's going to give the Spirit of truth to lead his own. So then, the grace that he's giving the church is the sending of the Spirit to keep the church walking in the truth. And that is why we have come for this program. That is why the Holy Spirit becomes important for us. That prayer adventure by his spirit. Because that, let me tell you the truth. It's not by your works. It's not by your knowledge. Even me that I'm st standing here talking. I cannot boast in it. A gay wave of deception when you rise up. If God not save me, I will be to carry me. Let me tell you the truth. There is nobody that is above it. It takes God. And so that's the reason why when the Lord has promised us his spirit, we don't take it for granted. We position ourselves to receive. Why? So that his spirit will direct us. His spirit will help us. How is the spirit going to help us? Not by visions. Not by miracles. Not by prosperity and by killing our enemies and redeeming us from the hands of our enemies. By keeping us within the world. But then Ephesians 4.30 now becomes important as we are asking for this spirit. Because the spirit, the spirit now began to say, grieve not the Holy Ghost. How do you grieve the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. So the Holy Spirit will teach you something you say you will not do. Ah. He will tell you that, look at this one, you say no. He will say, look at this one, you say no. He will say, walk like this, you will say no. And I teach, I was pointing my attention to that. That when we look at that Ephesians 4.30, go back to the church in the wilderness. That's exactly the same thing with the church in the wilderness. 
The Bible says, with whom was he displeased? But them that grieved his spirit. How did they give his spirit? He gave them his ways. Walk in them. They say, no, we will not walk in them. Ah, okay. Ah, yeah. Then he got to a point. He swore. He said, these ones will never enter into my rest. So, as we are asking for the spirit, let's have the understanding. Pastor taught on day one. What, when you ask for the, what are you asking for the spirit for? As the minister yesterday was saying, the Holy Spirit gives money too. That's very true. The Holy Spirit gives blessings. And we saw the Lord yesterday. Whereas he blessed us with the Spirit, he also gave us physical blessings. All of those are part of the package that come with the Spirit. But now, we should not concentrate on those packages. The Spirit was sent to keep us within the world. So then when the Spirit is telling us and keeping, I'm trying to bring us in the world, let us follow the world. Close marking, close marking. So that when that hour comes, when this knowledge that will be given to the church to bring us into the rapturable faith will be given, we will have the grace to receive it and come up in that image in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those for the rapture, the rapturable faith. What is it? It is a present reality that the bride will come to, the bride, the bride will come to, and that they will know that this thing is going to happen any moment now. May the Lord bless us in Jesus Christ's name. Shalom.